Hi guys, welcome to another vlog. So I've just come back from a break. Yes, I took a much needed uh, uh, three day break. You guys didn't notice it because I had recorded a few extra videos. So you had your one video coming in every day, but I just went on a three day vacation if you can call it. So I went to this tiger reserve in India, which has a very high density of, uh, of tiger. But unfortunately, the day I reached there, it started to rain heavily, very, very heavily. Now the chances of spotting a tiger generally in good weather are not very high. So in rain, the chances are pretty much zero, but I got lucky and I did manage to spot uh, a tiger. You can see the pics here. Yeah, this is the guy. Uh, so I had a good time, uh, but now I'm back and let's get started with uh, the vlogs. So what I'll do today is I'll take a few questions uh, because I've been getting a lot of questions the last few days and I haven't had the time to address them. Uh, so all, all of you who've mailed me, I will get back to you. Uh, just be patient. But I'll address a few questions in the vlog today. Uh, so the first question has uh, come from uh, Kiran. Uh, Kiran is writing from India. And Kiran says that he has been an average student uh, throughout his career. Uh, the GMAT score that he expects is around 670 to 680. Um, average uh, work experience. So for some reason, Kiran thinks he is absolutely average. Uh, so, so anyway, his question is, uh, so for a student like me, which is the best country or college to pursue my MBA from? Okay, Kiran, I must say you are a very modest guy. You're stressing a lot on the word average, but I'll take your word for it. Let's say you are an average uh, candidate and there are a lot of people like you, you know, an average candidate, uh, uh, you know, 3.2 GPA, 670, 680 GMAT, uh, decent work experience, nothing exceptional, nothing too bad. In fact, a lot of people would fit that profile. So where should such a person apply to? Now, if you ask me in terms of applying, you can apply anywhere. And I've seen some average profiles get into some top schools also. However, in order to be competitive uh, and to answer your particular question, Kiran, I would suggest you look at uh, Canadian schools. Um, of course, look at ISB in India. That will give you the best return on your investment. But from your mail, I gathered that you are specifically asking for international schools. So if I keep aside ISB, I would suggest you look at Canadian schools uh, for two, three reasons. One, they are definitely easier to get into than say schools in the US or even ISB, by the way. Um, and I'm talking about the good Canadian schools, you know, even the top ones like a Rotman or a Richard Ivey, you know, uh, um, I've had people with 640, 650 GMATs uh, get through to these schools. So while I'm not saying that will be enough, I've had students who've joined these schools with a low GMAT score, average profiles. So they're not as selective as the top US schools. So with the same profile, you will get a much better score in Canada than you would say in the US. The other reason why I suggest Canada is because it will be easier for you after your uh, MBA to stay there, look for a job or generally work there. I mean, you know, in the US, it is uh, the H-1B lottery that you will be part of. I've covered that in a separate vlog, so go through that. But that's a big risk. Whereas in Canada, especially if you pursue a two-year course, I mean, you can stay there for the next three years, work or look for work, whatever it is, but nobody will deport you. So that's the other advantage of uh, uh, Canadian schools. Also, the fees will be lower than uh, US schools. Though fees-wise, I think ISB would still be giving you the best return. So my suggestion, uh, Kiran, is uh, apply to ISB in India and uh, if you're applying to international schools, uh, apply to some Canadian schools. You can even look at slightly lower rung ones like say a Sodder or a McGill, even Shulik maybe, uh, because um, uh, I think you will be a good fit in those schools and you will like uh, what those schools have to offer. So do check them out. Okay, so the next question that I have has come from Simon from Brazil. Uh, and Simon has a very common problem, which I think a lot of students face. So good that this question is here. And the problem is, he's been preparing for uh, a few months now and he has started taking his practice test. Um, and of late, his scores are plateauing. So there's no change in scores. Where are you stuck? He's stuck on uh, 660 or thereabouts. So, so Simon wants to know what should he do to get out of this, uh, this rut. Now Simon, again, this is a common problem uh, and uh, one that I want to actually address because with most students, there will come a stage in your prep when your scores will start to plateau. 
So you started from a 550, went up to a 610, 660, you've been feeling good about yourself and suddenly it's not changing. So 660, 670, 650, 640, 680, 660, that's basically how it's moving but it starts to move in a narrow range. But there's an upper limit that you just don't seem to be able to cross. So what do you do in that case? You do two things. First, you of course analyze these tests and you try to identify your weak areas. And weak areas at a question level. So which question types are you relatively struggling with? Could be critical reasoning, could be data sufficiency, could be sentence correction, whatever it is. So first you identify that. Then you go to your OG. You must have practiced questions from the OG. So then you go and check how was your performance in the OG in these question types. If your accuracy rate in the OG in these question types was around 60%, 65%, then there was a problem at a conceptual level itself because that's not a very good accuracy rate. Uh, then you want to first work on your basics, which you should have done in any case earlier, but do it now and then come back and take tests. However, if you go back to the OG and you notice that your accuracy in the OG in these questions was pretty good, 75%, 80% or more, then the problem is not conceptual, the problem is your test taking strategy. So then you need to modify your test taking strategy. You need to experiment with a few things. Time management is one because it's possible that you are not able to complete the test in time. You may feel that you are able to because in the end you don't run short of time but you may have guessed on a few questions in the middle of the test. So that's why you did not run out of time in the end. But that's not the ideal situation. So check your time management strategy, check your guessing strategy. It's possible that you are not guessing and you should start to do so. That's also part of your test strategy. I've covered that in a separate blog. But it's possible that you realize that out of 37 questions in math, you can only do 32. Come what may. You can't do any more. Which means you will be guessing on 5 questions in math. So that's fine. Unless you're targeting a 51, you anyway will most likely get 5-6 questions wrong. So what you can do is you can decide what those questions will be. Don't let those be the five questions at the end of the test because there will be some easy ones in that. So what you do is you guess on five questions throughout the test. So you decide which topics you don't like for whatever reason. And if you get a question from that topic, you just guess. So what will happen this way is you will end up spreading out your guesswork and your score will not get uh, affected much. So that's just one thing. You know, guessing in a row could be a problem. It's possible that in reading comprehension, uh, you are not able to attempt the fourth passage, the last one. Happens a lot with students. By the time you reach the last passage, you've run out of time. So you don't read the passage, you randomly mark answers, in which case you will get three or four questions wrong in a row. And that will really hurt your score. So your number of mistakes could remain the same. But if you change the place where you're making those mistakes or the question types in which you're making those mistakes, your score could still improve. So pay attention to that fourth reading comprehension passage. I know a lot of students, you know, uh, falter over there. So that's another thing you can look at. So basically what I'm suggesting is you work at two levels. First, the conceptual level. You make sure that there's no conceptual clarity that is lacking. If that is fine, then you know the problem is with your test taking strategy. And then you totally focus on that. But make sure you've identified your problem correctly. If your problem is the test taking strategy and you keep working on your concept, there won't be any result, right? So don't work blindly. You guys are smart managers. So use those managerial skills to first identify the problem and then focus on how to rectify the problem. So that's uh, my suggestion to you, uh, Simon. So I'll take one last uh, question, uh, which has come from uh, Mustafa from Riyadh. Uh, so, uh, it's interesting how you know the GMAT is spreading uh, until a few years back I don't think there were too many students from places such as Saudi Arabia but now uh, I see a lot of people uh, you know who get in touch with me from uh, from the entire uh, Middle East region so so the GMAT actually seems to be growing in popularity a lot uh, anyway coming back to Mustafa's question it's a short question uh, I'm confused with so many OGs available in the market and online which edition of the OG should I purchase or should I purchase all of them? Of course not Mustafa, you don't have to purchase all of them. It appears to me as if you're just starting off with your GMAT prep. So then let me inform you that across the editions of the OG, the questions don't change completely. So don't think that if you buy five OGs, you will get five sets of different questions. In fact, 70% or 80% of the questions remain unchanged. If you look at OG 13 and 15, there was no change. The questions were exactly the same. 
what I suggest is you purchase the latest edition of the OG, which is the 2017 edition. However, if you have access to one of the older ones, like 16, that's also fine. Then don't bother with 2017. But if you're buying one, pick up the 2017, do it properly. Then what you can do is towards the end of your prep, you can only attempt the questions in OG 2016 or 2015, which have not been repeated later. So those will be new questions for you and those will be official questions. So that's how you can use the previous OGs. Only attempt questions which have not been repeated in subsequent OGs that you've already covered. Use them as a source of additional 20-30 questions of each type. But don't buy all the OGs, it's a bad idea. So I hope that answers your question, Mustafa. Also make sure, by the way, uh, that you get the other two OGs, the verbal review and the quant review, later on in your prep. Uh, because the more official questions you can get, the better. So I guess uh, that will be it for today's vlog. Uh, I shall see you guys tomorrow in a new vlog. Have a nice day.